So, Oz, thank you for joining me today. Um, maybe before we get started, I can give you a brief overview of um, the LSC Alternative Investment Society. It's obviously who you're speaking with today. Um, we are a society at the LSC that focuses on hedge funds, private equity, and venture capital. Um, we were founded in 2005, and historically, we focused on creating a two-day conference at the London Marriott Hotel, where we bring in industry-leading executives and founders like yourself um, and have them speak to more than 300 students that travel from all over the world to listen in. Obviously now, um, amidst the COVID restrictions, that format is not quite feasible. Um, and so we've uh, transitioned to an online format where we're interviewing um, executives and founders like yourself and publishing that on the internet. So. Thank you again for joining me today. And um, on that note, I'll get started with the questions. Okay. Maybe just to begin, um, could you give us uh, could you spend a few minutes giving us the brief outline of your background and your career? Yeah, so uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm Swiss, truly Swiss, grew up here. Um, then I studied economics at uh, St. Gallen Hochschule, OSG. After I finished St. Gallen, I went to Credit Suisse, my first job on the more on the corporate finance side. So I was covering Swiss multinationals, then they sent me to New York, and then I came back, and then I was a car manager for Swedish multinationals. Uh, I did this for a few years, and then Goldman Sachs approached me and hired me to build up an institutional sales desk for them in Zurich here. Before I started, then they sent me around the world, so I was in uh, New York, London, Tokyo, and then finally ended up here in Zurich, building up this institutional sales desk. That's where I met my two co-founders, Freddy uh, Gantner and Marcel Ernie. And uh, yeah, that's when we then, in relatively young years, uh, the youngest of us was 26, I was somewhat a little bit over 30, the three of us started Partners Group back in 1996 then. And Great. yeah, then I guess, uh, yeah, you want to ask things about partners group later on, I guess. Exactly. Um, but before that, I'd just be more interested about the actual founding of partners group. Um, I'd like to hear just how that sort of came about, how that idea developed and why the three of you decided to do to make it happen. Yeah, so it started First of all, I always wanted to be independent. That was kind of my goal. My father was a banker, but always employed. Uh, I always wished to be self-employed or start my own company. And uh, the three of us, as I said, we met at Goldman Sachs. Um, they actually just put us on commissions. That meant we had almost our own business. Uh, no salary, just commissions. Had a feel and touch like uh, your own business and then my two colleagues approached me and said they start their own company and I was kind of oh you guys crazy <laughs> and they said uh, I was the boss of them I said you should join us as well so that's how we started um, we just walked out of very well paid jobs um, uh, parents didn't understand it they said why do you walk out <laughs> Or a well-paid job. Um, yeah, and then we just started. We started Partners Group, as I said, back in '96. Our first idea is to, as knowledge of people, as we, to be honest, we didn't know how to write private equity at this time. Um, so we didn't know much about this industry because it was not big in Europe. So we started to do asset management, independent asset management for entrepreneurs. So that was our idea. Three young guys who understand financial markets. And yeah, that's how we started. Fast forward, then we figured out that many of the entrepreneurs at the beginning, when you start a business, you have no clients, you you, you need to make money somewhere. So one guy, Marcel Learning, he did some small M and A's. We sold some advertisement firms and so on, you know, and whatever their owners got five, 10, 15, 20 million out of the sale. They left it with us to manage it, and many of them were saying, like, you know, we don't want to invest in shares and bonds, that's boring. Don't we have any real assets that we could be entrepreneurial behind? That's how it actually started. 
back then, private equity was not well known in Europe, definitely not in, in continental Europe. Uh, actually, pension plans were not even allowed to invest in private equity, so we had the idea to do a kind of a fund-to-fund vehicle, so you have several private equity investments and list then this investment company on the Swiss stock exchange. So then immediately pension plans were allowed to invest into this asset class through a listed vehicle. Um, that was our idea. Uh, we teamed up just three young guys. Nobody would have bought this from us. So we were looking for a bank. We went from bank to bank with this idea and finally found the LGT Bank. Um, and together with them, we launched the first product, which we listed on the stock exchange, was called Castle Private Equity. And we raised, without any track record, I mean, had no, no track record at all, we raised 450 million Swiss francs. It was kind of the start. And then we did similar things with capital protection and so on. And that's how we actually started Partners Group. So. We didn't found partners group to do private markets. We found, but we moved towards it. And fast forward to today, 25 years later, we're one of the largest private markets as a manager with 100 billion on the management, 1,500 people out of 20 offices. It has happened a lot in these 25 years here. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, like you mentioned, you uh, found a partners group with, with Alfred and uh, Marcel, your your ex-colleagues at Goldman Sachs. Could you maybe tell me a little bit more um, about the relationship that you had with the two of them and how that sort of developed into a friendship that you can, you know, create a create a business on? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I always say also when people ask me or make presentations in front of students and so on, what's a good entrepreneur? And my answer is always a good entrepreneur knows where his weakest spots are because nobody is perfect. You know, everybody has his strengths and weaknesses. And a good entrepreneur knows his weaknesses and gets the best people for these weaknesses and gives them shares, hopefully, so that they are incentivized. We had the big, big uh, advantage that we three are so different that if you bundle the three of us together, then you have the perfect entrepreneur. Because whatever Freddie is missing, I'm strong, or what I am weak on, Freddie is good, or Marcel, which also speaks in terms of friendship. We don't do much privately to be together, to be honest, because we are so different. Uh, we don't have the same interests. We are very strong colleagues in business. We trust each other completely also on everything that if he once decided things, the three of us, and they've said you first and me on the more on the marketing client side, implement this this way, then they trust me that I do it right. I mean, they do investments. I'm not second guessing what they do on the investment side. So that's a real plus for the firm, I guess, over the years. And yeah, that's how we Yes, we had our fights. Uh, sometimes it was loud, um, but we always found together and we always said when we decide the three of us for something, and usually when you're three, it's good because if if you make a vote, the three of you, two say we go this direction, one say we go this direction, yeah, then you go the way the direction of the two. What is important is that the person who goes said we go this direction also follows this direction and stands behind it. And that has happened many times over the years. Sometimes it was pretty my idea, most it was against it, whatever that, but it worked out well up to today. And um, could you briefly describe Partners Group's investment style? Yeah, so on the private equity, so as you know, we do private equity, do private infrastructure, private real estate, private debt. The largest part, still 50% of our investments is private equity. So <clears throat> first of all, we are, I think today globally, the largest mid-cap private equity house in terms of size, deals that we do. Mid-cap for us means enterprise values, 600 million to one and a half billion. That's kind of our place which we like to operate. We sometimes do a two, three billion uh, transaction enterprise value, but we do that 
because usually the, the prices are too high. There is too much money around for the from the Blackstone's KTRs of this world. So we like like the the mid cap. The second thing that we are doing a partners group is. We have uh, four different industries that we follow, like healthcare, uh, IT, consumer goods, uh, services, business services, and financials. And in these sub-segments, we have uh, specialized industrial groups. In these teams are deal makers, people out of the industries who are in these teams on a global basis. and. Today we are actually looking for for companies that we see that we can do a transformational thing with the company. Um, and we don't do this. We are not sitting here in the old days. Private equity was kind of you sit in your office and the investment bankers send you the deals. That's not happening anymore. At least not for us. You, if you want to find good transactions, you have to work on this transaction. The way that it works is we look for themes. We have research teams in these different sub-segments. Then we go for a theme like um, like the veterinary business. So we have seen that vet clinics in the US is an interesting sub-segment. Uh, it's growing. It has tailwinds. Uh, people spend more and more on their pets. <clears throat> um, and it's a very fragmented market. So our research has figured this out. And then over time, and we went and looked at this market, we were looking who is available in this market. We like somebody who is already somewhat the market leader or close being a market leader, then you need to find the right management there. And this is a typical buy and build strategy afterwards. So we were buying Blue River, one of the top three player on, on vets clinics in the US and together with management, we are now doing a big acquisition one after the other. So we kind of develop trans transactions. You can't, the old days of private equity was very old days. Archie on Obisco, KKR was a pure leverage play. You know, Archie on Obisco was bought, I think with 7% equity, 93% debt. That's what I call leverage. So it was a deleveraging case. You bought something with high leverage, you sold the single pieces off and then you made the money. In the 90s, it was a multiple expansion. You bought privately, low multiple. You sell it later on a higher multiple. Forget about this. You pay the same price today in private markets as in public markets. Leverage is not so easily available anymore. We are having an average of over 50% equity in our transactions, so we don't make the money with leverage. It's really proactively finding the right companies um, and then really work with the companies. This value creation, this ping pong back and forth, this is the reason that private equity makes money. And obviously, the over time, the transactions, um, the size of the transactions have increased. But how else do you think that this investment style of yours has developed since your founding? Yeah, there are several things that developed. Uh, first of all, we are a fully integrated private markets as managed. So that means we have a fund to fund team. And if you look at our competitors, KKRs to Blackstone, they have started as pure deal makers and then later on have started to buy secondary players or buying fund the funds, Carl Leibold, Alp Invest and so on. We come a little bit from a different, we have from the beginning on, we had a direct team, a small one just for Germanic speaking Europe. We had a large fund the fund team and we built, we were one of the first players in the secondary market. So the fund the fund secondary grew faster than the direct business, but since 2006, seven, or about 14 years ago, the direct business has overtaken. Um, so the direct business is the biggest part today. These are different teams, but this integrated because for us, we have a lot of clients who give us mandates. We have also our flagship funds, like uh, Blackstone does, is now at Blackstone fund number 12 or whatever. They are, the founders are what, 15 years older than, than we are. 
we have this direct conference as well called Arch PG Direct uh, 2019 is the latest program at the end with all the different pockets it will also end up at 8 10 billion or so but only part is the fund and a big part is this different mandates and in mandates you use the direct side but also secondaries and fund of fund but direct is the biggest part and the differentiation as i said from us is first we are concentrating on this mid cap higher mid cap which our competition with the same size of team is looking at the larger transactions secondly we are extremely proactive we work on transactions 24 36 months before companies even up for sale or we as i said through thematic searching even figuring out which company we finally want to own because we like the industries and then we go to the management and see how we can buy this company. So a very proactive approach that we do. And that's a, a clear differentiator, I think. And also afterwards, the way that we work with the companies, um, there are kind of two camps in the private equity industry. I would call it more the financial engineering camp. They do a lot still through, through um, leveraging they don't have many people on the board themselves they're not very active they let the, the companies grow we are extremely active um, we have our specialists we have our very big rolodex of independent board members <clears throat> and these independent board members they are not really paid they are investing alongside us um, and our clients and we put always three to five people from partners group on the boards as well, besides the independent board members. And then it's very active at the beginning. It's on a two weekly basis that you talk to management, senior management, later on it's on a monthly basis. But usually it's on a monthly basis that you are very, very close. It's not like in public companies where you have every quarter uh, a board meeting and in public I always say public companies is it, the difference is in private equity it's uh, an entrepreneurial governance and in public market it's a uh, it's a regulatory governance obviously like this so it's it's much more public companies 80 percent of the board meeting is all about compliance and it's not really they don't really steer the management teams is also it's completely different. That makes the big difference in returns. Right. Now, you're also the chairman of um, PG Impact Investments, um, and social impact investing has been you know, a common theme in your background that you're very interested in. Maybe tell us where that's originated from and why you're so interested in impact investing. Yeah, I, I think it comes from uh, I always tell the people I have been extremely lucky. I was born at the right country, had the right parents, had the right education. But lucky that I started a company in a field which had a lot of tailwinds. I believe in this giving pledge, which you have in the United States and Europe, it's a little bit less common. I made this several times publicly known that uh, around 90% of my wealth will go back to society, I think. That's the right way to do. 10% is still enough. Also for my children and so on. So they should do the things themselves. Um, and then I was, it's it's almost more difficult to to wisely spend your money uh, for the good of the world. And so I studied this further and have then seen that um, like deep social impact investing is really working and you have a real impact because if something makes money over time it's here to stay so through social impact investing we kind of help the underserved people to help themselves that's how i kind of explain it microfinance is a typical example which is proven a lot of poor people, if they get a little bit financing, start to get from poor to middle class or lower middle class. Um, then I looked around and there are not so many impact funds, really deep social impact funds out there. Because there were not so many, I decided, or I asked my colleagues, 
shouldn't we do that? The partners group, we are a public firm, we can't do these small investments. There you don't have an EBITDA margin of 60% as we have in the, our own business. So we decided then not to do it in partners group, that we do it as a sister company. And this company is called PG Impact. I founded it and the chair of the foundation. This company is not owned by somebody, this company is owned by a foundation. So if this company makes wants money, which they will in the future, if you have enough assets on the management, uh, the gain of this company or the returns will go up to the foundation where we could do very early stage, almost venture, almost philanthropy type of investment. For PG Impact, up to today, we have uh, more than 300 million on the management there, over 20 investment professionals sitting in the different partners group offices, but it's a separate team. Um, they do, as I said, they do uh, energy investments in these countries. They do the whole debt side, microfinance. They do agriculture financing investments. Um, these are usually smaller in size, but there's a huge impact. And, and the impact is as important as the return. Even so, we strive for a return of the fees around 9 to 11% in dollar terms. And so far, it looks like quite promising. Um, and I, it's a clear idea of me. I have also put a lot of money in there so that they can manage. But we have also third party money in the meantime. But that's close to my heart that we built this up to, uh, to the global leader of impact investing. Not for the, as I said, I don't own the company, it's owned by a foundation. Partners Group has been very generous in giving workspace and everything, first money into it that we could start it besides my money and my co-founder who was a pretty company has also invested into it. Yeah, it's our way of giving back, so to say. I'd now like to shift this conversation more towards private equity and um, also Partners Group's involvement in the industry. Um, and maybe to start, could you just tell us um, why you prefer the private markets over the over the public markets? Yeah, private markets as, as I mean, there are so many studies done from Josh Learn from Harvard, uh, World Economic Forum, whatever. <clears throat> private markets outperform public markets by four to six percent of the fees per annum. Our best mandate in Q Super in Australia, they have outperformed the public market by even at nine percent per annum of the fees, which is a huge outperformance. Um, there are reasons, and there are reasons. I, people always say, uh, private equity has to have a higher return because it's illiquid." But that's a nice wish. It's a wish that something is illiquid that it should have a higher return. That's not a reason, right? There are real reasons why private equity outperformed all the years behind us. And um, these reasons, they are also the reasons why it will outperform in the future. Reason number one is before we invest, as I mentioned it before, we have been working on the company or the industry or whatever for many, many years. Before we really buy a company, we know everything about this. We have talked to management, we have turned every inventory. So if you would know as much as we know in a public firm when you invest, where would you go to? You would go to jail because you would be an insider, right? If you know much more than the market knows, you're an insider. Our private market, it's a private market. It's, you know, the more we know, the better investor we are. So that's why I'm saying this preparation at the beginning is very important before you even make the decision to invest into the company. So we are much better informed at the time of investment or even trigger this towards this time of investment. And then when we are an investor into it, as I said, the, our corporate governance is an entrepreneurial governance, not a governance of correctness, uh, what I explained before, compliance governance. It's we are together with management. Here is also a big difference. Management of private equity finance firms are completely aligned with us and our investors behind because they have shares themselves into the company. We usually want from our senior managers, the C-level, we want to see their financial statements and we want to have 
a very substantial part. If, if a CEO has a wealth already of 20 million, if he invests a million in a company, it doesn't hurt him. So for me, we expect 18 million. If it's a younger CEO who doesn't have created wealth and has maybe 1 million wealth, then 800,000 is already a lot. So they are completely aligned. They put a lot of their private wealth into the company. Um, salaries are usually not so high for these managements, but they make the money <clears throat> through so-called sweet equity and are completely aligned. If the company does very well, we all get rich. I mean, we have we have CEOs, they may they make triple digits millions, they made a hundred million and more out of the investments, but they made us as well six, seven times for our investors behind. Um, so you are much better aligned um, and we can make much more influence if, if management is not working out, we fire them, there's no golden parachutes or whatever. Um, so you can you can implement ESG much more direct. You don't have to report constantly. You can really develop a company. And uh, these are all the reasons why I think private markets make more sense. It's also interesting if you look uh, in the United States, I don't have the figures exactly in my head, but they have uh, public listed firms have since the 70s or since the mid 80s actually diminished. Um, I think it's over a third less public firms listed. So the private market gets bigger. And we hear from many managements who even were public before, they like the private markets much more as owners than anonymous public ownership. Clearly, you're not the only person that's very fond of the private markets and there's a huge influx in dry powder in the industry these days. Do you see that this dry powder can diminish future returns or does this only present greater opportunities in the industry? Um, I think returns will come down in the next years, but it's not only because so much more money is flowing in there, but we have much lower interest rates, so risk-free rate is much lower. Uh, public markets will also not have this, uh, you know, public markets usually say six, seven hundred basis points over uh, risk-free rate. And if we are 400 to 600 basis points over public markets over time, risk-free rate is zero, and public is seven, four more, and you are at 11 or 12 percent. So I think this 20 percent plus per annum of the fees, <clears throat> these times are over. Um, but partially as well, because you don't, I mean, the, the, re, the risk the, the risk premium is not much lower, it, but it is lower. Um, now, as I mentioned before, this industry is not a cottage industry anymore. This is now a really mature industry. There are different types of private equity players, um, what they look for. As I mentioned before, we are not looking for these very, very large transactions because they are the competition. There is definitely a lot of dry powder around in this area. In the global mid cup market, it's, it is also a lot of dry powder, but less, not as pricey. And as I mentioned before, today, it's you really, you really need to be business builders, like a, a normal entrepreneur. Like, like we, we are, we call ourselves institutionalized entrepreneurialism or institutionalized entrepreneurs. We are set up with all of the ways that we run partners group, that we are an, an, you know, an institutionalized entrepreneur. Now, there are many, everything is expensive today, but there are many entrepreneurs who start businesses or take over businesses and make them better. Um, and this is what's happening here as well. And as I mentioned before, more and more companies like to be private anyway. So you see much more, you have seen a lot of public companies going into private ownership again, because it's a, it's a better entrepreneurial ownership. It's a logical public, you are not entrepreneurial. You are employees and CEOs are employees. Uh, and we have seen what happens there. If you're just acting as an employee or you look for short term because you have stock options for the next two years, you have to make sure that 
the stock price does the right thing so you don't steer your company to being a better company but just to have a higher share price for a short period of time. And what is your response to those that believe private equity is immoral or damaging at times? Uh, you know, this is a phenomenon from the old days. You know, it's it's in the old days. I mean, there were even books written about it. I mean, Arjuna Bisco, all these deals, uh, uh, Bavarian, Bavarian at the gates. You know, there was the old days. You took a conglomerate, leveled it up and sold the single pieces out and that's how you made money you didn't care about the employees or whatever you were just uh, very cruel savvy wall street financial beasts so to say it's very hard to get away from this today this today first of all you can't do this anymore because you don't get this high leverage second of all you won't make money because everything you need to build businesses today and if you build businesses there are many studies who show private equity owned businesses do better uh, and in terms of you you can measure this especially with uh, employee growth i mean we, we have in over our company we have over 14 percent employment growth uh, so you make companies better you actually create jobs you're not you might when you take a company over you might do some restructuring but we not even like restructuring it's we like to make companies better so you you grow as well jobs and we should not forget that one of the biggest problems that we have today is actually our pension funds the returns that they can generate <clears throat> in the risk-free rate zero in switzerland even negative interest rates so you're taking away money from the pensioners and we consider this we have we have in our investment committee room up there where we have a big wall with different tvs as a big video walls where everybody dials in and we discuss about the transactions but above this wall is one saying which says we are responsible for dreams and we lift this as well the dreams is the dreams of the pensioners the more return we generate, we don't want the people come in and think about returns what they, they need to think for what, why do they work here? And our ultimate thing is we work that the, the normal workers out there, that their pension plan is having a decent return. And we have proven it over the years and you make your own math. If you have a, a 5% or Two like Swiss pension plans to do two percent per year, you make one point oh two high thirty over thirty years, you get to one point eight. Or you do, if you look at the private equity returns, let's say even if you're really bad, you have ten percent, you do one point one high thirty, and then you are at nine times the money. I'm not saying that you should put all your pension money into private equity, but we are definitely we are the highest returning asset class now since 20 30 years in pension plans uh, asset allocation you're the highest one and uh, that's also something that you do good for the pensioners so you clearly just described how you add value to your investors but maybe talk a little bit more about how you add value to your portfolio companies to achieve those returns now, as I mentioned before, first of all, we have a clear vision what we want to do with the company. As we first study the world by themes, um, I explained before the veterinarian thing. Uh, I could take another theme, uh, and I take something completely different, like like Vermont. Vermont is a, that's an ESG plus higher return story. So. Vermont and, uh, was a leading canteen company in the Netherlands. So they, they were running many canteens for companies, for museums and whatever. Um, it was family owned. They were very successful, um, but didn't have a vision how to grow further. So we, we had two visions. One is 
grow geographically because they had a very strong team. And the second thing is was how to reduce food waste in, in canteens because it's a big thing. And it's also a big thing on the bottom line because whatever you have less food waste gives you a positive, directly positive return. Right? You don't have to throw away what you bought. I mean, costs is food and employees and rent. But if you reduce this food cost for sure, then it has an impact. So our industry value creation team, our ESG team went in there and uh, they looked at it and said, there must be a way that we can reduce food waste. And we spent several millions. Usually a public firm is not doing this, spending millions for which something who might come out later on to create um, an, an, an artificial uh, intelligence system, which at the end every canteen had could actually punch into his iPad What's the temperature of this day? Is it rainy, foggy, cold, snowy? Is it pre-vacation, during vacation, after vacation, whatever, all these different things. And actually the thing was telling you what kind of menus you should bring. It was pretty amazing. And really, I mean, it worked. So we could substantially reduce food waste because we had exactly what people were looking for on these days. Um, so this, just a small little example that you really together with our team in the board, management was, even, was not even thinking about this. So we are during the build out, when we are invested in a company, we are constantly asking ourselves, I'm sitting, I actually had a board meeting this morning from one of the companies for equity release in, in the UK. So we are constantly challenging the the CEO and, and the different C-level guys. This is now a very difficult environment um, on the COVID for this because they come to the valuations of the houses and so on. So we constantly pressuring. And through this, I guess we add a lot of value in all. Cost. And then the second thing, as I said, is the bigger Rolodex. You know, having in every of the companies, usually the chairman comes out of the industry. We just sold PCI at over four times the money. PCI was a pharmaceutical outsourcing company for big pharmaceutical companies. The chairman of this was Franz Hummer. Franz Hummer was a long time CEO Roche and later on chairman. Roche is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies worldwide. This type of calibers we take in, he himself, Franz, put a lot of money of his own money into PCI, took over chairmanship. Um, you know, for a management, having a chairman of one of the real big guys out there uh, overseeing the management together with our guys on the board, that's very, very helpful. And you have mentioned how Partners Group is different to some of the pioneering PE firms, but maybe talk a little bit more about how Partners Group is different now to, you know, these current companies and these current competitors of yours? Uh, I think that one of the very big differentiators, there are a few who do this, but not many, is really this very proactive deal sourcing. Um, a lot of the industry is still waiting until the investment banker calls and says, we have now an auctioning of company XYZ who is up for sale. Um, but whatever, I'm not saying that we find uh, deals by our, also that we, we are never in competition. We are all, today you are always in competition. If a company is worth more than 50 million or whatever, there is, a, I mean, nobody sells a company without an intermediary, an M&A boutique or a bank. But the difference is when the bank book comes, or we sometimes even force the sale, approach directly or the bank book comes. We have already worked on this since 18, 24 months, 36 months. With one case in Germany, a very, very big, this was a big transaction. We knew the competition is big, called Techem. Techem, um, when the bank book came, we were really the only big player who had worked, we have worked, uh, 
was the 582 days or whatever before. We actually have a deal log where we see how many days we worked before a company is even for sale. In this case, when the bank book came, it was already in our global investment company. We have already talked to management. We, we knew this is going to come for sale in the next two years. There is an advantage to have this fund the fund team because they know all the other guys' portfolios. They know which companies might come for sale. So when this really came for sale, management knew us. We had a plan with management. We, we told them what we want to do with it before the others even started due diligence. And today, that's a big difference to the old days. Today, the banks give you six weeks, eight weeks to come up with a bid, final bid. Um, in this case, because we were so far ahead of everybody else, it took us two weeks and we put in a bit. And uh, yeah, there were some circumstances in Germany with, with spring vacations and we made some pressure and we could almost pre preempt this transaction. But this is a, this is a very big differentiator, working on many transactions long before you do them. Um, that's that's a big advantage of for the deal flow. And you are you get then decent pricings if you do it this way. Is proactive is one differentiator and the other one as I, as I mentioned before is just being very, very proactive with companies. There are some other groups doing this as well, but this long working on the transaction before it's I don't know any who are so long working before on a transaction as we do needs also more people because it's very time consuming and and if you look at our um, I'm not proud of it because as a company owner we should be more effective but we have the most investment professionals per assets on the management because we, we, we do this more structural extra mile um, and return you know if you look at the last three direct funds we or we just made a study our fund the fund team made a study and looked at our own fund as well as we would be a fund fund that they would choose and we are from the big names the, the, the known big names around the world uh, the, the, our team figured out that only Bravo is ahead of us and everybody else from the APEX, CDC, Blackstone, everybody is behind in terms of returns of the last three funds. And I think that speaks for it of our way of we, how we do investments. Certainly. And when your team, um, when they go to these extensive due diligence phases, um, what are some other things that they, that they look for? I mean, in, in the companies themselves, or yeah, or it? yeah as, a, as I mentioned before, I mean, the, you develop a whole thesis, what you're going to do with the company. I, I can't tell you what you look for extra. You have a thesis, what you're going to implement with the company. Um, you have a thesis where this industry, does this industry has tailwind or or winds against you. Um, I mean, we look, we like industries where you have tailwinds. Um, and then at the end, what what always is the very you can have a great business, great uh, tailwind for the industry itself, and you have a bad management. At the end, the management is is I would say more than fifty percent of the return. So. Picking the right management incentivizes the right way. Uh, that's that's almost a, an art, so to say. Um, and also figure out if you have the wrong picks, which we also had in the past, uh, then to change this quick enough. So we don't. We not only had uh, glorious things. We also had uh, not so good companies. But uh, we have hardly lost any companies. We, we, we were always aware. We found a way to turn it around and finally. And what do you believe are some of today's opportunities in private equity? 
Um, also areas that we that we really like in this environment, so we, we don't like cyclical businesses in this environment, the tile being. Um, we, we like a lot of things with health, aging, this area um, is, an, is a area that we like. Servicing companies, um, software servicing, and this part is a, is a big focus of ours. I would say these two parts. Having said that, we also look at, at consumer goods, we look at financials, but if you would ask me where do we see most transactions happening from our side is healthcare and business services at the time being. And considering the current trends, what do you believe are tomorrow's opportunities in private equity? It's, it's difficult to say what, what is, to, I mean, as I said, we, we look today to businesses to have, who will have a transformative change. That could be in, in global logic or such a business, you know, it's a high growth business. They go into, they have all the Fortune 500 companies helping them on digitalization. I mean, the, this company has I don't know, the, the 24,000 engineers in there. Our the business grows like crazy. The only thing who, and we saw this already, the only thing who, who is difficult there is to find enough good people. I mean, to, to keep up your employment pool um, with, with this Trumps. And, and this was so clear that this is that they will have such a high growth. I mean, that's a typical one, which, which you see. And then something which you always like as well is this whole buy and build area, what I, what I explained before with veterinary, veterinary clinics. We have done exactly the same thing with physio. I can explain this, how this, how this came. And there's always, this is, a, this is a journey until the end. So the journey started with our research team looking at all kinds of different healthcare sub segments. So the first thing that they found out is that physiotherapy, physio um, therapy is, the US is almost 10 years behind Europe. It's amazing. In the US, you just went to surgery. You, you didn't believe in, in physio. I'm overdoing it now, but it, it's kind of, they were really, and this is changing because surgery is much more expensive. Uh, it, it's not good for, for persons in general. You should try first with physio. So we saw this, and we knew it's going to change as well. So you have a lot of tailwind. So now you see that's an area that you like. So next is our whole research team went and looked at the physio clinic market in the United States. Very fragmented. The top, uh, the top, what is it? The top 14 firms have 10% market share. You see, <laughs> there's not a big player as many. So then we went down and looked at the top six, seven players in there. And we, we, we talked to all of them. We, we went to management. We, there was a process of months from our team. And then we figured out that Flu Confluent Health had an owner who built a physio clinic, uh, who had several dozens of physio clinics already built it up. He was a great guy. And, and we approached him and said, you know, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You, you are a great manager. We have the money we make now the physio clinic number one. And we don't want to have 2% market share, we want to have 20, 30% market share. So through this buy and build, and since we bought this company a year ago, we have almost, I think, doubled in, in physio clinics already. But you need to have the right management, have the same vision together with us, financing this, and you maybe pay for the original, you pay maybe over 10 times, maybe the multiple, but all the mom and pop physio clinics in Portland, three here, and in Cleveland, 10 here, they have no natural buyers. Um, and you can buy them at four, five, six times EBITDA multiple. Integrate them well, make a great brand out of it. And that's kind of, that's so clear that this will work. 
it's 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 an imp, it's it's an execution thing. It's not is it happening or not. It's going to happen if you execute right. But these things you have to find, and that's what we do day in day out. I'd now like to shift this conversation more towards general advice for young people. Um, and maybe to start off, um, what would be your advice to young people that seek to be great investors? Advice that somebody's going to be a great investor? Good question. Uh, I think one thing that you should try to do is um, at the beginning, I always say to the, the younger people is, is at the beginning, make sure that you are broad informed. Um, you know, you, you should be almost like a generalist at the beginning to, to, to get a lot of information, not just in one spot. Uh, if you are, uh, if you know exactly how, I don't know, how tea is made, you're a specialist in tea, then you can only invest in teas. I mean, you, you might be a good investor in tea, but that's it. Um, you you need to be broad, informed, broad, interested, understand how the world works, how the different sub-segment works, and so on. Uh, and that's what you kind of build up when you're younger. I mean, sure, the more mature, the older you get, the more you see, but you want to be good in investing, you need to, to to understand what's really happening in the world. I mean, it's not only one area. You need to be interested in politics. You need to be interested in technologies. You need to be interested in in uh, also in, in, in human social things to understand how things can happen and so on. So that's my advice. Be broadly interested. And what is the best way to go about creating this broad interest and expertise? Um, in, in, in general, people could go, and, and this is, I'm not saying that this is bad, but it's not something when you want to be an investor or private equity investor later. You could go and be very, very narrow and very good in one thing. Uh, which is good, you know, you, you are interested in one thing and you read only about this and you study only this and you focus only on artificial intelligence and do nothing else than this and you are really, really deep and good in this. I'm not saying that this is bad, but then you should go in AI and do something in AI, but you can't run a broader investment firm or whatever. The way that you get this information is, as I said, as a student, be interested in all kinds of different areas. Um, I did my different internship very broadly. I was at Swiss Bank Corporation Look and Learn program in New York for six months internship. I saw so much. I saw bullion. I saw forex. I saw trade finance. I was in the credit department, did some real stuff, credits and so on. Um, yeah, the broader you are informed at the beginning. Same thing like when you look at the Goldman had a very good associate program, the same thing there, you know, they said, here are all the employees of Goldman Sachs, just, I mean, the, the, the training program compared to, let's say, in a Swiss bank, the training program is line by line, you get there at eight o'clock and you do this and this and this. There they tell you, this is a big, great firm, figure out where you get the information. So the guys who were just sitting in a little cubicle and not going out and figuring and you have to it's it's you have to get the information to you. You have to you have to get it. It's not not sit there until information comes to you. I think it's a little bit difficult today with if I look at my sons and so on, with this uh, iPhone and social media from Facebook to Instagram and what TikTok and all these things today. It's kind of it it just comes into you. It you it's not an active search. I mean I said no no I actively go through I said but what does this help to you that you know that 
your colleague is now whatever sitting at the lake of Zurich and looks out to the swans. I mean, it's nice. Look at this picture, but what did you learn out of this? And you get so much into your brain by all these different things, which is you should proact. It should not be pushed to you. You should proactively search to what you want to know. And I guess the younger people today, it's just the opposite. You're going to be dumped on it. And, and this dump is even organized by artificial intelligence, figuring out what you like. Um, and and you, you, you will not form your opinion yourself. Your opinion is through the device put on you. And that's, that's a danger. And young people should be aware of it. I mean, I, I know that old people are always, they always say it was different when we were young, but I see this as a real threat of, of younger grown-ups today to, to build up their own opinion. You should do once a month without device and figure out what you like to know, what, not what others tell you what you should know or like. I see. Uh, and what is something that you wish you knew when you were 20 years old? Oh, there are many things I wish that would have known. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, that maybe the, the question is, is, is also a little bit different. What would I have done differently or so? I mean, if I would have known the private equity is going to grow so much, I would have maybe gone into it earlier than than I did. I was early 30s, I would have maybe gone to this industry already with 25. Even so, I'm not so sure if this would have been so good, because again, I would have been very specialized in this direction. So I'm actually happy that I did corporate side, a Credit Suisse, then I did the sales investment banking side at Goldman. So as I said, I I know how bullions work, I know how trade finance works. I mean, I'm not a specialist in it, but I at least know how it works. Um, and this is very helpful up to afterwards, Japanese warrants, convertibles in Latin America, blah, 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 the whole range. And that uh, gives you a good backpack for being informed later on. And then that helps on decisions that you take. You're a much better decision taker later on if you're better informed. So. And so if you were 20 years old now, you would sort of follow the same approach of trying as many things as possible before setting stone on private equity? Or what would you do if you were 20 now? If you were 20, what I would do different than in the old days, as I said, I would use this modern technology wisely. Um, it, it helps a lot, you know, when I was young, I, I had to go to a library to get whatever information you wanted to know, uh, how this tea is fermented, I had to walk into a library. <laughs> took me half a day to figure out how fermentations of tea works. Today, if I'm kind of interested why, why, how this works, I'm going into Google and 20 minutes later, I'm informed. As I said before, the most important thing is make sure that you, that you steer what you want to know, not because that's the danger about the system. The system tells you what you should know. I think uh, younger people today uh, comes to the same. You be happy that you have this imp that you have this advantage. That you, I mean, there is nothing that you not know how it works. You can go on YouTube and you. It's amazing. Even I can even take my car apart and together again with <laughs> YouTube. Not that I'd like to do that, but I would be able to do this. Um, that's amazing. That's so different. And I mean, you, you younger people could not imagine that you had a handbook to my son. I always said, why don't you open from time to time a handbook? We have now just moved. We have new machines in the room. The handbook still gets you more information than whatever. But that's in, in general, 
I think a differentiation. But as a 20 year old, I come maybe later on this, what well, you do in life, I think the first 30 years of your life should be considered, uh, say broadly, education or filling your backpack. It's, it's not, it, it's really important. I mean, the other people that we have in the firm here, associates that come directly from an EBA or an MBA. And they, 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 they always want to know, where's my career? Where's my career? Where's my career? And I always tell them, look, think contribution, think and use this time. It's, it, it doesn't matter if you're a year faster or slower on the next level. Think about what do you need to be the CEO of this firm? Uh, if, if this is your ambition, or if your ambition is head of infrastructure team, go, uh, of, of, of the partnership team, then, then uh, you know, it, it's make sure that you get so much information, get all the knowledge into you. And, and then later on, if you have so much knowledge, you can be a very wise manager, wise investor, wise leader, or CEO of a firm. Um, but if you lack this and you just want to be as quick as possible or deal by deal and nothing, don't think left and right, don't think contribution. We always tell our people the first thing that they hear is a partner thing, a partners group, think about your contribution, think about contribution, not career. Career comes automatically. If you bring the contribution and the contribution, not only giving to the firm, but also taking from the firm information. Um, some do this, some not. I don't understand when young people don't go out with different people from different departments. They always stick with each other, you know. Private debt guys sit together with the, you should talk to the private equity guys, you should talk to some to the lawyers in the firm, you should talk to the to everybody to, to get the bigger picture. Uh, because you will need it later on if you yeah, want to move up. I think that's a great point. Um, the next question I have is uh, what do you think was the biggest mistake? that you've made in your professional life and now if you could go back in time how would you approach that issue at the time um, with your knowledge that you have now i think uh, i think i had an incredible fortunate in my professional life and fortunately in my professional life things kind of of I've always mo moved one after the other. Yes, we made mistakes, or I made mistakes, or the firm, or we together made mistakes. But the saying that you learn out of mistakes is really a good saying. I mean, many things, as an example, when we started, were the three of us, and one of our clients at a bank, a private banker uh, approached us and said, uh, oh, I was waiting for this. I wanted to start my own business as well. Can I join you as equal partner? I bring you up to a billion in assets on the management. And uh, uh, I had a little bit of money made at Goldman. And at the start, I stayed a little bit longer at Goldman to make money. So my two colleagues started first, and I paid in 200,000 Swiss francs so we could buy a few chairs and and some computers and so on. And this other guy would have, it was the was the fourth equal partner. And we were so stupid. The guy came up with an incredible story why we, we had we said the four of us we pay ourselves hundred and twenty thousand Swiss franc salary. But we only paid when we make money. So postponed. We don't pay salaries. And for, for almost two years we didn't pay salaries. We leave from our um, what we have put aside. And he came up with an incredible story why he needed this 120,000 now and he needed it in cash. Can you imagine? We went to the bank, we took a bag of a plastic bag, and put 120,000 in and handed it over to him. Um, and he promised to bring all these clients from it. We made some due diligence, we didn't went in completely blue eyed. But 
the guy apparently did some fraud before and he knew he has to go to prison and he will lose his job at the bank. And he thought, oh, these guys just take them a little 120,000. And he did. He was so stupid. So, so from the 200,000, he paid in 120,000. <laughs> to Mirko Jan, if you ever get to a person with the name Mirko Jan, watch that. The guy is incredible, uh, fraudulent in a very high level because he did the same thing in Germany before, apparently, and yeah, whatever. So that's definitely a big mistake you don't want to make at the beginning. Having said that, the advantage of it was we were very, very careful afterwards. So fraud was very difficult to be done with us uh, because we, we, yeah, so you learn from these things. And I assume that you've never you never seen that guy again then after that incident. No, I saw him once because he, he had them. So the way that we figured out, he said, I'm going out to the United States and get all these accounts opened. And he got even a special permit from Swiss Bank Corporation at the old days, even non-bank employee could open up account. And uh, and he uh, he told us he's now flying away and then we never heard of him anymore until we sent him a, 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 what he called it, a, a call for, for the payment. He should pay us back and then he was returned to us because could it be delivered because he sits in prison and so on. We saw him once after where he tried to tell us another story and yeah, we, we, we had no, no hands on him. He, your personal life is protected. We were not even informed for personal protection when he can leave the prison. So that was definitely a mistake. A bad one at the beginning. Um, what is one thing that you think university students tend to undervalue or don't give, don't give enough weight to? Uh, I'm, I'm still coming back to the same discussion was said before. I think so, social skills being able to talk with each other, not talk to your device or talk through the device to your colleagues is something which is extreme, which is missing a lot. It's this, um, yeah, it's this uh, bonfire feeling, you know, go out in the woods and sit together in a in a camp and, and talk to each other and don't, don't, it's the social skills because later on in life you will see successful business people are, most of them are very strong in social skills. Um, and, and you, you, this is not something, I mean, partial part of it is given to you by birth. There are some people who are more open and some are more closed and so on. Um, but overall, it's something you need to do, socialize, but not socialize through TikTok or whatever, socialize through going in the woods and sit around the bonfire. Yeah. I'd now like to um, conclude this conversation with just some more, more general questions. Um, and the first one being, um, which other business person um, that's generally, you know, quite accessible just via Google, for example, do you admire personally? Business, I, I am not the person of admiring overall. Uh, maybe it is not a business person. It's a person I admire because he has built up some a, bit, a business, but it's not a business, it's a big charity. So his name is Johan Kors. You can you can Google him, Jon Kors. He is a he won what 20, 30 years ago. He won, I think he won most gold medals on a on a on a Winter Olympic. He's Norwegian skating. He has several. He studied economics. He has a medical degree, and after his glorious sports way, he I think I think Olympics. The Olympic Committee asked him to join them to look because he always wanted to do something social, but he was too 
extreme, too much association and so on. And then he started Right to Play. And Right to Play, you can Google that as well, is an incredible organization helping underserved youth through, the, as it says, Right to Play, through playing to come over tragic situations, to learn how to fight malaria, how, how to be much more attentive. People who go through these programs, it's today a company, I call it company. It's a charity very well run who has, uh, in the meantime, about 50, 60 million turnover per year. And he started this as a grassroots, zero at the beginning. And today there are about two and a half, three million kids playing every day on the system of right to play. That's a guy which, I mean, in the meantime, he kind of retired from right to play because he's now in his mid fifties, never made really money because he worked for charity and you don't get high salaries. He has four kids. So he, the last 10 years, I think he now starts as well being a businessman, but he will be also a successful businessman. But that's uh, somebody I admire what he has built up. It's an incredible organization. And I'm curious to hear about um, what mentors you've had in your life that have helped you and your general opinion on the significance of mentors. Yeah, as I said, I'm, I never really kind of admire people. It's, it's, so it's a mentor should be somebody you admire. I think maybe the, my uh, accounting teacher in high school uh, uh, two reasons. One, I think if you want to be in economics, you need to be really savvy in accounting. You need to know, I mean, accounting is almost uh, one time so the, for mathematicians. If, if, you, if, you, if you are not really deep into accounting, not that I like accounting, but I understand accounting. Uh, and he was an incredible teacher. I mean, uh, he, he was maybe not such a good teacher because he didn't care if people could follow him, but if you were able to follow him, you, you came to an incredible high level. And, and he, he, he was kind of meant to because he was a guy as well. You could ask him whatever you wanted. He was highly admired by everybody because he knew everything. You ask him something about biology. He was very, he has been reading about everything. He was not just an accounting teacher. He, he, uh, there was even a quiz in the Swiss TV which he joined where he could make money. They ask you questions, you know, general questions from geography to art to music to whatever. He had the highest points ever of anybody. I think he won a half a million or whatever. I mean, the guy was, inc was incredible. So from there, I guess, I got this thing about trying to know as much as possible broadly. Uh, he was definitely one of these guys. Had his strengths in accounting, but he knew everything, so to say. And what is your general opinion on the importance of having an individual like that in your life that can either assist you, mentor you, or you know, at least inspire you to, to do certain things? I think there are people who, who like for me, one person who, who brought me as well, and it's also about the book, which I tell everybody they should read, is a book called, uh, it's a small booklet actually. Uh, it's called Gospel of Wealth from Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, as you might know, was once in the late 1890 or whatever. If you read the book, the booklet is funny. It almost sounds like today. But he wrote it in 18 or 1900, or whatever. You know, he was the richest man, and, and he influenced me a lot because if you read this booklet, it's he is extremely non-socialist. It's he says, if you are bright, if you have money, make money as much as you can do. You 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 should you should make the world better by being a creator. Use he says, money is only used to. As a, as, a, as a tool to make. And he was completely against inheriting money to the next generation if they are not capable to use it. Money should be always with the people who are capable to use it. So that's an interesting book. 
Uh, he also writes in there, which I very much think about the same, is as what I said before, the first 30 years of your life is education. Make sure that you get your backpack. The next 30 years is make sure that you make most out of this backpack for yourself and the world. And then the law, if you're then successful, like him, he was, I guess, the richest man at this time, he then said, my last 30 years, well, usually, hopefully, you get an idea, the last third or the last third of your life, make sure that you efficiently, if you were lucky and be a millionaire, that you efficiently make sure that this money goes in, in the right way back to society. Uh, he was the guy who built all these libraries in the old days. He said, you know, I should help everybody that if they want to read and want to learn, they should at least have a book. So he put all these libraries out. And he was a fan of music. That's why he put all these music houses out. He said everybody, also the poor, should be able to listen to music, not only himself and so on. An interesting, an interesting book, interesting thoughts, which you can even even think about today. Interesting that you that you mentioned this book that you like, the Gospel of Wealth. Um, I'd also be keen to just hear about more books that have sort of shaped your worldview and your perspectives. Um, just on not necessarily books, but also just general ideas that you have. I, wouldn't, I, I don't have to. I, I think this is the book I would really recommend. I mean, all the others are more like books from economic books and so on, but they are not really shaping your thoughts. You know, I could not even tell you the titles of them exactly. I mean, some of the writers clearly when you read really the Keynes and Friedman, so, but all of these things are kind of overdone today because I think that's, that's a big problem of today's world, financial world, is that nothing, uh, everything which has been written in books in the old days, you know, Keynes, Friedman, all of these different theories, they don't work anymore. Uh, today, you, there's just the Feds, they're just printing money. The balance sheets of the, the Feds around the world are so high, it's astronomically high, you don't know. And that's why you have interest rates since 15 years at zero. I mean, in Switzerland, even at minus. Imagine this. I mean, you, you can get loans here at zero. You can get mortgages at minus 0.1. I mean, why would you not buy a house if you have minus interest rates? It's like the world is crazy. So um, I would say all of these books that you might have read once or that I read once, you can throw them away. And I, I cannot even give you the solution. I really don't understand it anymore. It's... Uh, the only thing is in, uh, that I understand is if you own a company, that's why I'm going back to private markets, if you own a company and you know what you want to do with this company and it's and, and the company makes sense and the company produces something or, or has vet clinics or something which makes sense, then go for it and, and, and that's that has a real value because the rest, stock markets per se, Tesla at where they are now. Okay. Can somebody explain me why Tesla should be? I, I was driving a Tesla as a nice car, but the valuation is so insane and it gets insaner by the hour. And I don't know where it ends up, but I don't think it, this should be worth so much. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, but that's just how it is. I think one final question then to wrap this interview up. Um, talk to me about the best advice that you've been given and um, the most important life lesson that you've had. Uh, the best advice I got from my mother is it's a phrase. In German, it says, wie man sich bete zu man. I think in English, it says something like, as you make your bed, so you must lie on it. I think there is a phrase in English similar today, or the piano sounds how you play it. But the thinking about behind this is, 
don't blame others where you stand if you don't like what you have at the time being being it your girlfriend being it your job being it whatever don't blame it to others change it it's in your own hands so everything is possible i mean yes if you are sick if you have cancer you can't change it but everything else there is no reason to be unhappy there's no reason to have a depression without in, in good health and and grown up where we grow up when all your students at your school have the fortune to get uh, be, be students at a good school so it's in your own hands so the same thing that that goes through your whole the whole career if you blame it on your employers if you blame it on your superiors if you blame it to change it take it in your hands that's entrepreneurship as well you know the way that you make your bed you lie in it and it's not the environment it's yourself so that that was always my thing i mean i whatever if i don't feel comfortable with something i i change it and it, I can change it because we are human beings. We have a head, we have a brain, we are intelligence. So do it. That's my final word to all of your students. Do it. Thank you very much. Um, this okay. interview was really, was really insightful. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and yeah, all the best. Okay. Thank you both.